The Full Exposure Podcast is made possible by Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn in appreciation for the contributions that artists and creative minds provide to our community. Arts and culture are essential to a rich and rewarding life, strengthening our overall well-being and our appreciation of all that we see, hear, and experience. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of Full Exposure with me, your host, Brian Kelly. Today's guest is Dustin Dwyer of Michigan Radio. He's a reporter and journalist with them. And um, this episode was uh, recorded some time ago, actually, a few months ago, in early June. June 10th, to be exact, is when Dustin came into the studio to have this conversation. And I just want to kind of recreate the backdrop of when this conversation occurred and what Justin was doing around those the, those events. But uh, as you all recall, in Grand Rapids on Saturday, May 30, there was a lot of unrest downtown. Um, there was a peaceful protest during the day on Saturday, May 30th. And that uh, when it turned dark, uh, there was also some darkness of uh, some violence and property damage and um, some some fires lit and some other things. It was quite a dramatic evening. And uh, that happened on May 30th. And then Justin and I talked on June 10th. So you can imagine that uh, the reason I had him come in because of his background in, in economic and social issues that he reports on across the state of Michigan for Michigan Radio that this would be a, a fascinating conversation. And um, I think it's interesting to look back now uh, just with some distance of three months on this conversation. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, some very complicated issues in Grand Rapids. Um, we talk about how Grand Rapids is still a very deeply segregated community. Um, we talk about systemic policing issues within the Grand Rapids Police Department, and uh, Dustin's done a lot of investigative reporting around those uh, incidents and, and their approach to policing in our city. And we also talk about how whiteness is embedded in our community in such a way that it often can be um, almost invisible to white people. Mm. And uh, I'll leave that there, but it, we really sort of unpack that in this episode. So with that, let's, uh, let's introduce Dustin. Uh, Dustin has been a Michigan radio reporter since 2004, and he's become a specialist in a craftsman of longer form reporting on economic and social issues across the state of Michigan. So let's explore the bigger picture with writer, reporter, journalist, Dustin Dwyer. And Dustin Dwyer, thank you so much for popping in. We've, I'm trying to remember where I met you the first time, and I don't really, I really can't place it. And I don't know, we, I feel like I know you, but we haven't personally interacted very much. Yeah, you we know? just sort of see each other around town. Yeah. yeah. I, I, can, I can tell you the first memory I have of running into you. I think we might have known each other on social media before real life, because there was a period there in Grand Rapids when, like, there were only a certain number of people on Twitter. So, like, you, you knew okay. everyone on Twitter, and sure. I think you were one of those people. Yeah, it was an early, pretty early. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, well, that was it's weird. The first time I, I remember seeing you in person, though, was at the first art prize um, when you were doing those videos. Oh, yeah. And the, and the video that you did about, what was the name of that artist? Um, Young Kim. Young Kim, yeah. yeah sorry, Young, Young Kim's, Kim. Young Kim's work. And I remember you did that beautiful, that beautiful video with Josh, and uh, that was the first time I was really aware of your work and what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, that was everyone fun. watched that video. It was there was a big movement behind him uh, at the time, and that started a whole thing because I was only um, that going back eleven years now. Yeah, almost twelve since that first art prize but I was just contracted to do certain types of photography for them and yeah. then because the Canon 5D Mark II camera had come out and I, I bought a couple of them yeah. uh, it was like oh this thing has HD video and for no one asked us to but Josh and I were just messing around and yeah. kind of doing some at the time the term was cool wayfinding <laughs> <laughs> it helped man because that was the first year of art prize and we didn't know what to do with it. And there was like, yeah. 
how do you know where to find the good stuff and uh, or you know the interesting stuff and that video really that hi- it highlighted that piece in it and well it was said, a, his work is amazing I, I was blown away by by this you know and I think we're all as grand opinions more familiar with how artists will seat their work in a site specific place yeah and now it's uh but that was a you know involved photography this clay silk screening he mm-hmm. did putting portraits on the sand and the impermanence of it and just the that was it still is probably my all-time favorite art prize piece yeah it's one of my most memorable art experiences i've yeah. ever had like with a work of art i think he would have placed much higher there was like a, a war zone of construction all around him yeah uh at that building which is yeah. now the lambert edwards building right um but yeah, that was one, and he was a super nice dude uh, yeah, too. I and I got to know him a little bit, and then he came back the next year. Yeah, and um, I think he got top ten that year too. But he was at the art museum, yeah. and somebody just walk <laughs> walk through his work like in the first right. few hours right. he finished right. it. Right. 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 It's like what? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we were still trying to figure out how art works in this town, yeah. but um, that's yeah. that's that was my first memory of Brian Kelly. All right. Well, I mean, vice versa. I remember seeing you around. I do remember seeing you at, um, yeah, through social, and we'd, we'd uh, have whatever um, shorthand there was when we would bump into each other because yeah. we were, uh, you know, yeah. have each other's Twitter feeds and yeah, have, like, yeah. some shortcut of, like, oh, okay, and I kind of know what's going on yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and, uh, but now I've just watched your career grow. We're now your, uh, you know, I... I, I you may push back. A well-known Michigan radio journalist, NPR affiliate. Okay. And sure. yeah, you'll take that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but I enjoy your work very much, and it Thank usually you. has a. Um, you know, you're usually digging around. You're not just reporting and reacting to events. You're able to do some some investigative. I don't mean like in a crime sense, but more on social justice issues or just problems eating away at the community. Is that mm-hmm. fair? How would you describe your work if you're like, so what kind of covers stories do you cover? Yeah, Dustin? I mean, I try to I I try to see the social justice stories. Um, I am and have been. Locally focused journalists. I, I try to cover this community. I mean, I've done lots of stories about the economy. I've done lots of stories about, you know, businesses and things like that. But I live in Grand Rapids, and it's my job to cover Grand Rapids, and so uh, and that means try to cover all of it. Right. Um, and those issues, you know, social justice issues are really, really pressing, really important issues in this community, certainly right now and, and have been for a while. So it's like you just you can't be a local reporter and not look at things like that and not examine things like that. Well, especially now and, and let's I, I just think we just dive into the to the kind of um the elephant in the city right now, mm-hmm. you know, with the in the country, not just mm-hmm. us, but but your perspective locally on on uh, you are embedded in a couple of peaceful protests. Has also one that that was uh, the famous one a couple s- Saturday ago, a week and a half ago. It seems like a lifetime ago already. Yeah, yeah. Um, that turned rather, um, I wouldn't say violent, but there was some some vandalism and destruction. Mm-hmm. There, unfortunately, nobody was hurt. But so you were reporting and doing as much as you could to figure out what was happening. As you look back a week and a half or so after that, like. Um, what what kind of uh, rear view mirror do you have just on that particular night and how it exploded? That Saturday night? Um, well, I, I, I can only say what I saw that night. Um, I, I got down there late. I was not there for the earlier part of the protest, which was peaceful. Um, it was a huge gathering down on Monroe Center, and I was sort of at home just, you know, monitoring social media and uh, the... Michigan Radio, which is where I work, we cover the whole state, right? So we cover several cities. So not everything that happens in Grand Rapids is news for us. So it's often the case that something will happen in Grand Rapids that, that's kind of important to Grand Rapids, but people in Ann Arbor don't care. Mm-hmm. People in Detroit don't care. So we don't always jump at every single thing. Yeah. And I am, there's only one of me in Grand right. Rapids now. Yeah. We used to have two reporters, but now it's just one. So I'm the only reporter for Michigan Radio who's living in Grand Rapids right now and covering Grand Rapids. The other thing is that for me personally, um, I just had heart surgery in February, and right. I was I had so I had been out for that, and I was coming back, and my doctors were like, you know, you're 
you're still high risk. We want you to try to take precautions. So I wasn't going into the field. Mm. All the interviews I've been doing the past several weeks have just been over the phone. Mm. So when this protest happened in Grand Rapids, you know, I talked to my editors about it, and I said, you know, I'll, I'll monitor it, but I, I know some of the people who will be down there. If, you know, if it's important, if it's statewide importance, I'll try to you know, I'll call them up and I'll try to make sure that we get those voices on. But I wasn't there physically, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, as you said, things took a turn uh, in, that, in that demonstration right around sundown. And uh, the police used tear gas or you know, chemical agents. They like to be very specific these days. But... Um, and they tried to disperse the crowd, and well, isn't pepper spray the vegan alternative <laughs> to the chemical stuff? Is that what I, we're talking I, about? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Like, <laughs> I don't have all the ingredients list for all of those things. Um, <laughs> but there were there were agents used in the street, dispersal agents used in the street, sure. and um, and then you started to see some some damage being done, some windows being smashed, and that's when I left my house and and came downtown, and I live in Fulton Heights, so I'm like two miles away. So I just drove down and and I walked, so I parked at GRCC, I walked down the hill and I arrived. The first thing I saw was the corner of Ottawa and Fountain uh, where the county building is, 82 Ionia, and people were just going at it. I mean, they were there was a fire in a dumpster, a massive fire inside a dumpster, and people were just smashing windows mm. and trying to start a fire inside 82 Ionia. And it, it was just a lot of people, and there were no police anywhere. Um, after a few minutes there, eventually a fire truck showed up, and police showed up. Uh, actually, I think it was sheriff's deputies who showed up, and they were there for a little bit. I moved on, and I was walking throughout downtown, and I just saw that windows had been smashed. It was actually surprisingly quiet and peaceful, in a lot of places where I walked, um, but people had been smashing in windows or they were going into stores. They were doing so some some cases quietly. And, yeah. and still I walked for 30 minutes and didn't see police. Mm-hmm. And I was walking around the section, of, you know, if you're from Grand Rapids, you know the, the sort of core of downtown. Imagine north of Monroe Center, you're um, west, of, west of Division, east of Monroe, and south of Lyon. That mm-hmm. whole area was just... Um, people were smashing windows, going into stores, just doing whatever, mm-hmm. and there were no police around. They would show up temporarily to put out fires, and that was about it. And I was between your stream and the Wood TV stream, uh, <clears throat> the police seemed to be gathered mostly around the police department and, and the first block west of Division on Fulton, and they seemed to be at least uh, less tactically concerned with what was happening at the courthouse, if they were aware at all because of the, the lack of presence and then also uh, you know, just one block over on Pearl when all the right. cars were... I mean, it took a right. long time for the fire department and stuff to get there. Yeah. I'm not... I'm not. It's not an analysis. It was just my, my yeah. observation. But it was odd how Fulton was tied up with resources from police and the outskirts, which are literally 100, 200, 300 yards yeah, away, it were, was were undisturbed and people did a lot of things right. without worrying about being and, seen. And the city manager talked about that afterward and and, um, and discussed it. He, the, the, what they said was that um, they had seen what happened in Minneapolis when the 3rd Precinct got taken over and and police had to abandon it. And the city felt that protesters were trying to do that here, trying to take over the police department. And as, as city manager Mark Washington said, he said that w- we were not going to allow that to happen. So they put all their resources into protecting that building and they didn't, they, they didn't respond as quickly to other things. So that was the choice they made based on, you know, the resources they thought they had that night. Mm-hmm. But we've seen in the days since that, you know, there were, when the national guard came in, when the, when they set up a perimeter, they set up a perimeter that was around the police department. When when the National Guard left and the dump trucks were still there closing off streets, they were closing off streets around the police department. So they've walled off, essentially, the section of downtown where the police department headquarters is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just the, the reality of, of of what happened, you know, that night. Yeah, and... Um and as you live stream, did you... I'm curious because I, in my own mind, the only way I can reconcile... Um, 
Well, we were talking about when we did the photo shoot, but I, I, I have a hard time. The only way I can reconcile is, is there was a very peaceful protest, a very diverse part of the community. There was families, there was children. Um, mm-hmm. And then they dispersed and some people hung around, and then at night it took mm-hmm. a turn somehow. And we see this with all kinds of events. And I, I um, you know, people get caught up in a moment and they see things happening. We see it with sporting events and just the, the, the psychology of what happens during these crowd sort of mm-hmm. events that turn um, destructive. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I very much, uh, my, my biggest concern was just the, the reason for the protest in the first place is very easily... Um, uh, lost, whitewashed because of vandalism and mm-hmm. riots and destruction of buildings and property. And I didn't want to lose sight of how we got here in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, um, but as you observe that night, um, do you have any analysis of like the cross section of people that seemed to me, at least on the live stream, to be very pretty young people? Like, I, if I had to guess, so they were under 30 under 25 a lot of them yeah fairly diverse yeah and um did you have a sense that they were connected to the larger movement of protest peacefully that got swept up or were there just people that seemed to be um enjoying the the chaos and the and just the destruction of what's happening well without having a scientific poll of who was there that night i would what I observed seemed like a mix. Uh, they were young, like you said, and as I wrote in one of my pieces about it, about that night, it, it was probably the most diverse gathering of young people I've ever seen in our downtown, and we know, uh, those of us who live in Grand Rapids know that it, it's a segregated city, and especially downtown can seem very segregated. Um, that night, it was quite a mix. Um, I, I saw white people and black people side by side smashing windows together, um, Some of it did seem like, a lot of it did seem like what you might see uh, in a riot after a sports event or something. It was just opportunistic. People were smashing windows because, um, you know, when you're 19 and it's Saturday night, I mean, smashing a window, I mean, that's not totally a boring idea. Like, they had an opportunity and and they smashed a window. And there were people down there with their friends. I mean, it really just seemed like a gathering of, you know, there would be four or five young people in a group together, and some of them would smash a window. The friend might say, no, don't do that. And, they're, and you know, they'd be arguing and be like, no, let's do it. It's fun, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So there was part of it. But I, but I, wouldn't, com- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't separate it completely from the other stuff, from the political stuff. So I talked to two young people who kind of pulled me aside. They were like, hey, you work with radio. And I was like, yeah, what do you want to say? And they said, you know, we're down here tonight, um, but it's for a good cause. And they were saying, you know, we need a change. And they certainly felt that um, there was a purpose to this, that it wasn't just random smashing. Um, now, those two young people, I can't say, I didn't witness them smashing, so maybe they weren't a part of that. There were also lots of young people there who their, their energy and their attention that night were not focused on the windows or the property. They were... They were right up in police's face and using their voices and um, screaming things and saying things. And a lot of the graffiti, if you, uh, if you saw the messages, if you were down there before it got cleaned up, you know, a lot of what they wrote was a cab and fuck 12. Um, Mm. if we can say that on this family oriented podcast, you say whatever you want. All right. So that's what, that's what people were saying that night. Mm. And again, it was a diverse group of people saying that it was white people. It was black people, but they had that message. For people they who had don't that message know, just uh, to illustrate, or just say what ACAB means. And ACABs 12. is all, all, ca- all cops are bastards. And uh, fuck 12 is a, a, a shorthand that came from, uh, I, I think the references were, where these kids got it from were from rap songs. And what I've read online is that 12 was originally a code for the narcotics unit of a police department. But it just, get, it just became shorthand or the new sure. way of saying fuck the police. And they also say 13, they're 1312, which is yeah. the numeric alphabetic numbers of yeah. the ACAB. So, so. That, was, that was being said all night long. Sure. It was being screamed directly at police. It was just being said out loud, and it was spray painted all over downtown. So if you want to say that like, oh, what happened in the early morning hours of Sunday and the late hours of Saturday wasn't related to police police issues or police community issues. I mean, I think it was, yeah. um, but it was a different messaging than what people wanted to say earlier in sure. the night. Well, and I think, you know, if you had to, you know, just 
take some snap analysis. I mean, certainly the majority of people were not engaged in destruction of property, even if they were down there. They were either observing or still confronting That's true. police or still That's mentioning. True. Yeah, there were a lot of people down there who were just really observing. Yeah. Well, it was like, it's a bit of rubbernecking, right? It was yeah. like, this is happening in my city. Part of me was tempted to go down yeah. and look and photograph, but then there's something you mentioned, a 19-year-old smashing windows. I'm 51, and I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm bulletproof anymore. <laughs> I didn't. I wouldn't have been fearful, but it's just like you know, if you stick your nose in it, might you might you might get a, a bloody nose. In terms of, I didn't really have a reason to go there professionally, yeah. and I also didn't want to. I just wanted to observe and sort of process. Um, but th- actually, that's an important point, and and I thought I would have been more afraid uh, going down there. And it's an important point to distinguish between what happened and and what could have happened because. I, some parts I feel about the way it was described, it sounded like it was just utter chaos, total destruction. Everything was madness down there. But it it really wasn't anything goes. Um, as bad as it looked, and it, as unbelievable as some of it seemed, uh, I did not witness uh, people being, you know, assaulted or pushed around. I didn't feel unsafe. Um, there were definitely some scenes on some places where I wasn't going to intervene or say, hey, stop doing that. Or, sure. you know, I didn't want to involve myself in, in what they were doing because I was afraid of, you know, whether they would push back. But at the same time, the, the, the violence that we saw was violence that was directed entirely at property. Um, and uh, it was smashing windows. It was, it was starting fires. Um, but it was not, I didn't... I, I didn't feel f- afraid for my own safety. And I think that's an important point to distinguish between because um, as whatever was happening, I think, I think that the people who were there just made that distinction in their minds. Mm. They weren't down there to hurt people. Yeah. They were down there to make a scene and to break things. Yeah. Um, well, and that's the, you know, I think uh, what we've seen nationally, not just Grand Rapids, to give Grand Rapids a, a fair shake in it. This has happened in almost any every city of any sizable population, where, right. you know, where there's been protests, and not all of them have turned to having some property destroyed. But um, you know, I think the larger thing is just how the community. Uh, you mentioned how Grand Rapids is a segregated city, and and maybe we transition at this point because I'm I'm curious from your reporting. In your observations and interviews, how how do you sort of see the construct of the city being segregated, and maybe where some of these um, systemic issues that we have just boiled over with frustration? Because I think people are tired of trying to uh, use the proper channels, and this. Mm-hmm. they don't feel heard. And there's been a long legacy of kind of. Um, you know, anecdotally, I think lip service without a lot of uh, momentum mm-hmm. uh, being sustained towards progress. We've seen some in the last three to five years. I think there's been more of concerted effort. But from your in covering cases with the police and some our own issues of brutality and some some things that have bubbled to the surface with our own police department, but maybe you've seen something broader. Like how is Grand Rapids sort of organized in a way that? Um, feels like there's some disenfranchisement uh, from your perspective. Well, you, you could go pretty deep on that. You could go, <laughs> you could go, back, you could go back a long ways yeah. on that. I mean, you know, here, here's a story, Brian. Um, you and I are white guys living in this city. I live in Fulton Heights, um, and I have, uh, my wife and I own our home, and we have paperwork for, for our title. Um, if I look in that paperwork, there is a page that says ownership of this property is restricted to members of the white race. That is still there in my paperwork um, because uh, at one point in this city, there were racial covenants. There were, there were rules about which races could own property. Um, and we're in the north, Yankee North. Yeah, in the north. This mm-hmm. this is all true in the north, and I think a lot of people have heard of redlining, and they understand how there was, um, you know, racist policies in place with with regards to mortgages. But but it it's not just some system that exists out there that is part of some history that we don't know. Mm-hmm. The house that I live in has a racial covenant that prohibits 
black people, Hispanic people, Jewish people from owning that home. That property was not allowed to be owned by anyone other than the, the white race, as it was defined uh, when it was written. My house was built in the early 40s. Now, here's the thing. So in the 1960s, thanks to the civil rights movement, racial covenants like that became unenforceable. You can no longer restrict ownership of mm. homes to members of certain races. You can't discriminate on the basis of race in housing At least on the general. page. On the page. But, yeah. but that page is still there in my paperwork. And um, even though it's, it's legally unenforceable, it has never been broken. My neighborhood is still extremely white. Um, not entirely white, but still mm. extremely white. And my home, as far as I know, has my little, my little square piece of property has never been owned by anyone other than a member of the white race. Mm -hmm. So those structures were put in place by people who we would, it's fair to say they're white supremacists. They had a white supremacist vision of the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, we sit here today, nice, well-meaning white people and think, well, I'm just going to be kind to people and that's going to solve the problem. Well, that, it doesn't solve the problem <laughs> because these structures were put in place and they, and they persist. Throughout generations, they persist, even though the property's been sold, even though all these things have happened, um, these things still exist in our city. And we can take that right up to any number of things, any number of histories that you want to look at. And I think you were alluding to the more recent history of GRPD, and those are very real things that have happened. Yeah. And I think those maybe influenced what happened on Saturday more so. Sure. Let's hit pause on that. We can pick it up in a second. But I think the residue of these things, even though they're technically unenforceable like in real estate and in banking and redlining um, there's a lot of residue in that 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 it might be technically illegal but we function as a society very much yeah. that way these things aren't overtly if you ask most people white people in your neighborhood they would think they were pretty um, uh, you know probably fairly woke in the in yeah. that term and I yeah. hesitate to use that word because right. I think it, it's uh, it, it they would uh, be fairly um, uninformed about just how um, invisible some of this stuff is unless you're black, unless you're a minority right. in this community, and then you battle it every single day. Because you can't ignore it, right? right. Because these are bar you, you're, it, it It inhibits your mobility. Mm -hmm. And so... But when we move so effortlessly, we're like, well, what's the problem? You know, I mean, yeah. like, it's, I don't really see what's happening because well, you don't have that first person perspective. It, of it. It, it was possible for, for those things to be invisible. And I think, you know, this gets into a broader discussion about, you know, whiteness and how it operates and, and how whiteness operates on white people. But I think a big part of it is that it makes it invisible to, to people who would otherwise be allies to people of color. A lot of the impacts of whiteness um, are, are invisible. And, and you could say that in policing as well. As a white person, I don't have police interactions like black men have in this yeah. city. Um, and up until the point where we had uh, a lot of cell phone videos out there and police cam videos, mm -hmm. um, that never would have become visible to me. I never would have heard about it. Yeah. Um, and in the past few years, it's become more and more apparent. And, and there have been, it's been more and more impossible to deny that that experience is not just a few a few incidents, right? That's a widespread experience yeah. for, for people of color in this city. That, yeah. is their, that is the majority of their experiences with police. And, I, and we can pivot to some of these modern problem, more recent in the last three, four years of incidents that seem grotesque on their surface. They've been documented that way. They seem very hard to rationalize in terms of how people behave as human beings. As professional public safety officers, it doesn't seem to be um, something that preserves anyone's dignity, right, in terms of how they conduct the business. So without getting into too many specifics, I wanted to go back because I remember, do you remember Chief Dolan, uh, Police Chief no, Dolan? No, I think that came, was before my time. He came up here from North Carolina or South Carolina and, and really tried to take this, this um, community policing uh, you know, and they put in basically mobile trailers in, in yeah. you know, more uh, the, the southeast side of the city right. and the west side of the city. Right. And, uh, in all the neighborhoods you would expect, but they w it was under the guise of kind of like um, patrol beat cops, you know, mm -hmm. and getting to know people. And I think the intentions were good, but uh, I don't think it was particularly eff effective in that way to have basically a, a, an outpost, a militarized kind of outpost mm -hmm. 
where you seem to be embedded, but it wasn't like, hey, Tom, how you doing today? You know, yeah. it was still kind of, um, seemed to be kind of a, a, a bit predatory in its, in its use of, um, of enforcement, you uh-huh. know? So, yeah. but, um, and that was a while, and we've had, I think, one or two, chief, two or three chief, police chiefs since then, and our current police chief is fairly new to the position, but he came internally, correct? Yep, yep, Eric Payne. Yeah, um, and Chief Payne, I know is meaning, you know, he's African-American, and um, I don't know, have you seen a pivot? We have a, an African-American um, city manager now, which I don't, I don't think we've ever had that. We've had one mm-hmm. black mayor in our history mm-hmm. of uh, Grand Rapids with right. the Lyman Parks. Lyman Parks. And, um, you know, I mean, these are, but we're also talking about police and police unions who are very fierce in, in defending yeah. and, and, uh, and wanting resources, you know? Yeah, so some of this history, like you're talking about, came before my time in Grand Rapids. I've been here since 2009, 2010. Um, but in covering the police department since I got here, there is sort of this pattern of, okay, okay, okay now we're going to do this. No, no, you know, we're going to expand community policing now. Okay, we're going to change our youth interactions policy. Okay, well, since the community is upset about this, we're going to do this. And Chief Payne has been one of the people internally at, um, at GRPD who's been most involved in trying to build those bridges between the community. And you do see officers who are trying to do that. You know, if you go to the Boys and Girls Club, you'll see police officers there trying to build connections with young people. Um, it's not as if those things haven't happened. There's been lots of community meetings, lots mm-hmm. of city council meetings, like city commission meetings. All of those discussions have happened. Um, policies have changed. And yet, um, we still s- continue to see these incidents. Um, which most people in the city find unacceptable, where officers will be pulling weapons on young children, um, or tasers or guns. Um, they will use force. Or just in- detaining them with handcuffs while they do something. And uh, uh, the trauma, if you took one of my daughters and hand- a police officer right. handcuffed them mm-hmm. when they did nothing wrong, mm-hmm. I, the psychology of that and the long-term sort of view of how safe are we right. uh, is fragile. And I don't know, you know, so these things have big consequences. Of course, they make a huge splash when something seems obviously, uh, you know, unnecessary. Yeah, and we had another incident in the city. So that, that particular incident, I think the one you're referring to where the young girl was handcuffed, um, that caused an uproar. They changed a the policy. They came up with a new youth interaction policy. And months, just months after that happened, you saw officers pull a gun on young children and you saw children crying in the video and um, and that was completely okay under the policy under the new policy which had been reviewed and I think if you talk so my understanding of it is if you talk to an officer they will say things like well we just pulled a gun off of a 15 year old last week or something like that we got a call of you know two young black men uh, in red shirts and we think they had a gun. And a police officer will say, if we think the suspect has a gun, what we want to do is show overwhelming force from this start. They'll call it, I think it's called a felony stop. So they immediately pull their weapon on the suspect, and they wait for backup, which means they could be there minutes, for several minutes, pointing their gun at this young child. And then other police officers may show up and point their gun at the young, young person. And to them, that is a safe interaction and that is a perfect, that is, that is a, a well-executed stop. Mm-hmm. They follow their policy. They try to keep people safe. Um, and, and that is considered good policing mm-hmm. to do things that way. As a community member, of course, it's appalling. It's terrifying. Yeah. A grown person pointing a gun at a child. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely unacceptable and traumatizing to the child, to the whole community, and it happens repeatedly. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, the place where we're at right now is that these things have happened so frequently and, and have continued to happen in the past several years. And the, the city has said, you know, go through the process. We'll, we'll uh, change the policy again. We'll do this. We'll have more community meetings. We want to hear from the community. But 
stops like that are still considered, quote, good policing, and so they still continue to happen. And you have a number of people now who are in this city and in many other cities who say, we've tried the right way. Yeah. We've heard, we've had these conversations. What else can we do to make sure this stops? Well, there's a, what you do when the, in that situation where they follow the safest and from their perspective, the safest way to conduct uh, a stop like that of mm-hmm. any kind. Mm-hmm. Um, the balance of power is upside down, you know, and you're removing the power. They're, they're doing everything that they can to mitigate the risk to that officer or any officer. Mm-hmm. That's their number mm-hmm. one priority. Mm-hmm. It isn't finding out first. For their first priority isn't to determine really anything except the officers responding are not going to be hurt. Right. When that is your blind solo, like laser focus on any particular stop, you lose a lot of information in that. And you also, I think, um, inflict the type of damage that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and you it's do, pretty and hard you do to do more like, harm in that one interaction yeah. to community relations that you've been trying to build up over years. And I think, you know, what makes it such a big issue is that is because um, it's, an, it's not a neutral proposition. In a city as segregated as ours, in a city with a history like ours, with, with housing segregation, with racial segregation, those stops don't happen in my neighborhood, right. in my white neighborhood. Yeah. I hardly ever see the police. Right. If you live in, in, in a neighborhood that was historically redlined, south of wealthy, you see police all the time. You'll see stops like that all the time. It's yeah. practically a, a, a thing in this city for white people who have who started to gentrify south of, of wealthy to now have seen, have witnessed some of these things. I've seen it myself, actually. I saw one of those stops on wealthy. There was a person who called into a city commission meeting last week who said, I, mo- I recently moved to Baxter, and she didn't really know the situation she was in. She identified herself as white, and she said, I saw the police pull their guns on a black man, and it totally changed her perspective. She witnessed it. She saw it. Now, if you're black in this city, you've been seeing it all along. Mm-hmm. You know, all your, it's happened to all your friends. And, um, and so it's not surprising at all. And one of the reasons why I think it's, it's um, so widespread is that, so the, in the case that I witnessed on Wealthy, I, I, I spoke to the police after. They pulled, this, they pulled these two young men over. They put, there were like five police cars, guns pointed. They made the two young men kneel in the street. And, um, and By young men, weren't they around 14 or something? Well, these, so the one that I witnessed, this is one oh, that this wasn't. this is the one you witnessed. This is the yes, one that I saw personally yeah. on Wealthy. So they were maybe 18, 19, and they stayed calm. I couldn't believe how calm these two young men were. I mean, I was terrified, and I was, the guns weren't pointed at me. Um, but they remained calm, and I talked to the officers afterward. I was kind of livid. I mean, my, my, my adrenaline was pumping, and I was, I was there with my children, and I was like, you know, if one of your shots went off the wrong way, I would have been hurt. And the officers were like, well, we had, we had a robbery earlier in the day, and we got a call that it was two young black men in a blue car. So, so that information was enough for them to make a stop and to point their guns all at these two young men. Now, these two young men were innocent. But are you going to pull over every black man in a blue car in this city? And when the calls right. come in like that, the Grand Rapids police is assuming every young black man with a red T-shirt or in a blue car or whatever is that suspect with a gun. And the, the end result over years and years and years is that half the city's young black men have had cops' guns pointed at them. Right, and you wouldn't take the same sort of uh, stop sort of procedure I don't imagine in East Grand Rapids where you would say, okay, there's a white four-door sedan with two white teenagers in it. Uh, Again, I think it would be rare that a random car would get pulled over at gunpoint. They might invest. They might pull them over. They might (laughs) act. You know what I mean? But I don't. The other thing is that that type of crime is just much less likely to happen in a historically white neighborhood because there hasn't been this history of disinvestment. I mean, why do all black? You know, why? Why are there? Why? Why are um, people of color disproportionately in neighborhoods where there's poverty? Because of because of the housing segregation, because of the mortgage discrimination, because of racial covenants, because of the generational poverty that has been forced on communities of color. And what well, happens yeah. in neighborhoods where there's, there's extreme poverty? Mm-hmm. Crime. Right. Well, and I also think, um, to give the police a break here for a second, I mean, it, it starts, <laughs> there's many systemic issues. Some of them just be, begin at, at childbirth. If you live in an impoverished neighborhood, it starts with the uh, neonatal nutrition. Mm-hmm. It starts with uh, 
food scarcity. It mm-hmm. starts with in, food mm-hmm. insecurity, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts with our um, our public school systems, how they're funded off of property tax values. That mm-hmm. were districts with lower valued properties have less funding to deal with. They might have more children, but they have less funding than some of the suburbs where the property values are higher. So we're creating a systematic thing. The other thing that I'm always impressed upon when I think about food insecurity and I think about just what times of so-called financial uh, insecurity I've had in my own life, how stressful that is, how stressful it is on a family, how stressful it is on a marriage or a relationship of some kind. And when you live in that constantly and add food insecurity, if I was 12 or 13 years old and I was hungry most days and I felt hungry most of the time, there's no telling what I would have done. I would have started in stealing candy bars at a a gas station. Just just the amount of, Mm -hmm. of things that an aggression that might build in you mm-hmm. over time or that feeling of um, disenfranchisement being reinforced over and over again, well, then you're now all of a sudden you might get a, a petty misdemeanor or it might now you're in the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Now you have a pro officer. Mm-hmm. Now you're in some type of... You know, like It's very hard to break out of that cycle when you... D- these circumstances were yeah. environmental right. all along, but... The outcomes, um, are, it's so much harder to break free from that, either through family tension, single well, parent homes. All those things are part of poverty yeah. and food insecurity, and all these things make but it even very hard you, to sustain that. Even if you do break free, say you're a straight A student, you're a perfect kid, you go to church every Sunday, but you live in that neighborhood where the kids are all exposed to those same effects, and there's a kid two blocks over who's who's struggling and is getting wrapped up in the criminal justice system and making bad choices. Mm -hmm. You are making the right choices, but when the call comes in, young black man with a weapon in a gray t-shirt, if you've got a gray t-shirt on, all your straight A's and all the things that you've done to make the right choices in those circumstances are out the window. The cops pull you over as if you're that criminal. Sure, and you'll be face down on the sidewalk until they determine you're not that person. And, and, and in that sense, it's systemic, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't mean to disparage all police in this conversation, but I think it's good to have a harsh reality, into, uh, har- you know, not harsh, uh, uh, a candid conversation about the challenges. It also, with this, what might be perceived as criticism, um, also helps underscore the, the tremendous job that they have to trying to conduct their jobs, given mm-hmm. w- what they're charged with handling uh, within the community. So, yes, there's good officers. There's bad policies. There's um, well, I think that's where the the conversation now seems to be going in this city and and elsewhere around defunding the police. Which some people say abolish the police. Some people say defund the police. But um, I think. What does it mean to you? Because I don't see it as imbo- uh, um, abolishment. Well, or, some pe- some or people certainly say. I think it depends on who you ask. I think some people are one hundred percent for abolishing the police mm-hmm. totally, um, and some people are just for defunding the police. And what they'll say is that t- to them, what they mean is um, take some of the responsibilities that are currently put on police and put them somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Not every call that comes into nine one one requires someone to respond with a weapon. Mm-hmm. Right, police officers are being asked to be social workers. They're being asked to be, um, you know, psychologists in some cases. Sure. It is it is a difficult job, um, but I think the point of of a lot of people right now who are talking about defunding the police is that you don't need a police officer to do that job in every circumstance, yeah. and you certainly don't need a person who has a gun strapped to their hip show up on every scene for these types of calls. I watched a documentary in the last month or two before all this happened. It was on HBO, and it's about two cops that are crisis intervention cops. They uh-huh. don't wear uniforms. Uh-huh. They do a lot of like suicide um, interventions, um, domestic abuse situations, and they go and defuse. They just go talk to people and earn their trust. Many times, if a different type of unit responded to that, um, there's uh, several people going to jail that night under whatever charges they they want to press on them for that. 
And it's amazing the outcomes. Um, I, and I'll send you the name of it because I think you'd be interested in watching it. Mm-hmm. But it just follows two officers that you know really f- have a different approach to policing. I think it's in Texas somewhere. But um, I think when people talk about defunding, that's the kind of things that they're doing. It might not be police officers, but there might be units where it seems to be where people don't feel like they're in immediate danger where they can be some type of response that isn't an officer whose first job is to kind of parcel out who's guilty and who's innocent and who do I need to detain and bring off to the, to the, to the city jail for that night or press charges or write a ticket or whatever it might be. Yeah. Because that's, there, it's kind of a transactional relationship. You're going to show up. Police rarely leave, I think, in those circumstances with like, okay, everything seems diffused and, uh, you know, we'll... We'll just carry on. And I think uh, one thing that's becoming quite clear is that it, this does seem like a turning point. After years of seeing stuff like this happen in Grand Rapids and in other cities, um, there is uh, a large enough group of people, and I don't know if you were there this most recent Saturday, they were, the streets were filled in Grand Rapids. And this, this protest, uh, the this one most that recent went protest. All through the city? Yeah. This most recent protest didn't, didn't result in property damage, yeah. um, but it was thousands of people. And, you know, my neighbors are marching now. Um, this, there, is, there are a lot more people paying attention who weren't paying attention before. Mm-hmm. There are a lot more people seeing things that they didn't see before. And um, I think this is, part, this is where the debate is now. I think if cities are going to say, well, we're just going to change this policy or that policy, or we're just going to try to recruit a couple more officers of color. Like, that's not enough anymore, I don't think. I think well, the debate yeah. is, the public debate, I think, is moving on toward well, bigger, think, more systemic solutions. I, I think what's happened by this broader support is it was so, the events of all this stuff that happened after George Floyd and all that. It was so viscerally disturbing and unnecessary, and we saw it all with our eyes, at least in that one case, and you can extrapolate how often that has happened historically. And I also think that um, because of that, and then also how some police and some, some parts of the country have responded to peaceful protesters uh, who seem to just reinforce <laughs> the, the reason they're protesting in the first place, uh-huh. um, that I think it is more sustainable. I think it has some legs. I mean, typically when it's something about a mass shooting or some other type of horrible event, there's some something else pops up or legislatively or just we lose energy and momentum, we lose interest in it, and whatever issue that is, it, the, the clock runs out. The game's over for a minute, and then uh, I mean, we should say for, for some people, <laughs> for people who look like you. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think the, I don't think you know. Yeah, I, I will fully I, own that. I don't. I don't think people party. of color in this city can really forget it. <laughs> but it does. Yeah. It, well, that speaks just what I said is that perspective that needs work because I'm exemplifying that I'm just reinforced that the people in power tend to be white and mm-hmm. do this stuff, and if it isn't part front and center of your mind, I'm, that's the part that I'm interested in these conversations that you yeah. just brought to me just by popping that little, that little tap of perspective, which I... Well, it's true within newsrooms, too. I mean, it's, it's certainly true within our newsroom that, um, you, know, you know, Michael Brown happened, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin happened, um, and, uh, and there was attention focused on it back then, mm-hmm. and then... You know, newsrooms sort of moved on, and and I don't think a lot of police yeah, departments Garner, faced. All stuff, yeah, yeah, I don't think a lot of police departments uh, faced real massive structural changes. Mm-hmm. I, I think this moment might be different. You know, also I think more people um, have more time. We're not so engrossed because of COVID and and being safer at home and all those other things. We're not as engrossed in our daily sort of mindless activities that sort of divert your attention and, and maybe we have more time to get involved, attend a, a rally or protest and that's creating some scale and then I think when you do attend those things, if you've never attended them before and you see some that activism in the street, it's quite a transformative experience to feel whatever you feel during one of those and the sense of community that arises out of it is helpful and I think that that's contagious, and I think that we're hopefully seeing the, 
that translate into uh, more sustainability towards change? Because I don't think people are going to, I, I don't think that we're going to let people slither out of accountability now um, as, as easily as they were before mm-hmm. to have meaningful change. And I think that's a, where I don't speak into what that meaningful change is. I wouldn't know. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't want a position at that table. It should be for people who are, uh, do that. But uh, the police thing is just one thing, but did you ever uh, go through the leadership Grand Rapids program that no. the chamber does? No. It was transformative to me. I had two major awakenings. One was leadership Grand Rapids talking about systemic problems that start with all, all of it. Neo, uh, like I mentioned, pre, prenatal care. Yeah. There's yeah, also yeah. the problem if you're um, uh, if you're a child, if you if you're a baby, and the family doesn't engage in just reading yeah, to yeah, a child, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. You, their sense of literacy, they're delayed, their mm. reading skills mm. are delayed. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that are, you don't think about that are predictive in terms of development of the entire community. It's almost like a crystal ball into yeah. looking into systemic problems. Yeah. Uh, Leadership Grand Rapids has this program where you do um, all, all different models about that, and it opened my eyes to all different parts of the community, and we also dealt with uh, racial prejudice and our own prejudices, uh, and being begin to awaken to see how we look at those. And the other one was just the uh, I went to the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Uh, I went to the Civil Rights Museum and I saw where MLK was gunned down, and it would just change my life. I went to Graceland the day before, mm-hmm. thinking I would go to just go see Elvis's place. And I'm not a big Elvis fan, but I'm sort of fascinated with him just as a Graceland and the yeah. era of life right, in Americana, right, 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 right? Right, right, right? And then the next day, it was like there was a barbecue joint that was right by the R- Lorraine Motel, and, and I wanted like, oh, barbecue. You wanted and barbecue. So the next day, I went and had barbecue, and I was like, yeah. But I, it was such an iconic. I wanted to see the front of the, the facade of the yeah. motel. With uh-huh. the, I wanted to see what I've seen in my whole life of that horrible incident. And then I bought a ticket and I went in and I. It, it's an amazing exhibit yeah. that they built behind the real motel of now. It's not a motel anymore. You can't stay there. It's all behind that facade is uh, a museum of civil rights and the movement. And I couldn't, that was just an awakening I never had before in terms of the struggle, the peaceful struggle that happened in the 60s and the Freedom Riders and all this other stuff that happened. And I was like, this is I, this is a whole world I did not understand. This is a whole struggle I could not even wrap my head around. That's and I'm still trying to learn. Yeah, <laughs> still, right. But it, those were the two catalysts of like going, okay. Um, well, the, the, what it rec- and I haven't been there personally, but what it, what it sort of reiterates for me or where my mind goes when I hear you saying that is, is, is it's just a reminder for a person who's been white their whole lives that one of the reason, the one of the ways that, that whiteness operates, one of the horrible uh, mechanisms that's in place is it just makes those types of things invisible to us. It, it's impossible to grow up black and not feel that, right? You know, right. If, if you grew up black, um, you, you had an aunt who was the first and the first black person in her company. You have a, you have someone in your family who was alive that night and who remembers that and who, yeah. who could speak about that. It's just not an option, and it's not possible for you to not feel those things. Uh, you know, they, you you could still visit that motel and still be moved deeply, but it's not as if your eyes would be open to something you hadn't seen before. Yeah. And for for but for a white person, um, that history is made invisible, and it's. And it's not accidental, and it's not neutral that that's the case for people like you and me. That yeah. we just we're just not raised to see that. Well, and it was uh, I had another formative experience um, during our prize actually, and that was um, Sean Warren is his name, a painter. And maybe you saw this painting yeah, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, last place. Yeah, yeah. Incredible painting about the um, the in Tulsa race Tul- riots. Tulsa, the Black Wall Street, where they just yeah. slaughtered people and burned this very affluent black community. And I'd never been taught that. Nope. I'd never seen it in no, a history neither. book. Me neither. And I don't know anyone. Like, I, I don't think I knew about Tulsa till Jamil Robinson told me about it. <laughs> 
I didn't know about it until I was confronted with this painting, and he yeah. was standing there, yeah. sort of interacting with people that came by. And I said, "What is what is this?" Mm-hmm. And he told me, and embarrassedly, I said, "I'm sorry, I don't know this." And he goes, "That's why I'm here, you know, to point a light at these things." And how is it that that can be? It's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. It's not actually. I mean, this is a this is a, a form of denial for us as white people that, like, we know that the world was, uh, that, that there were a lot of white supremacists, that, that there was a lot of white supremacy in America's history. We know that white supremacists held pe- positions of power. We know that they did things and made things happen in this, in this uh, country and in our cities. And yet um, we walk around with the way things are today, and if you're white, you can sort of imagine that it just, will just all happen this way. <laughs> it didn't right. just happen this way. Like, it was built this way by specific people for specific purposes to exclude specific other people. Right. And if we just go along about our sort of daily lives, we won't ever see it or notice it or be able to dismantle it. When you talk about, like, uh, policies being changed and all that and uh, laws being enacted or how we address funding for this or that, I can absolutely empathize with the notion of, of the black community just utterly rolling their eyes at that and saying that that's, that's going to change anything because I'll tie it back to my visit to the Lorraine Motel and the Civil Rights Museum is that MLK was shot in 1968. That was the year I was born. I'm 51. Okay. After MLK was shot, there was some reforms and some laws were passed to give... <laughs> equal, you know, more equal protection and some, some, that they were fighting for it during my lifetime when I was born. Like, mm-hmm. it's the, the amount, the, to think that we've healed the stain and scar mm-hmm. emotionally, physically, you know, systematically in 51 years because we passed some laws and in integrated schools is laughable. And I right. think that people, again, speaking as two, two white guys, I'll, I'll annex you into this part of it, <laughs> but just to say that Many of our friends, uh, my friends, they don't see that. They think that it's some world that you haven't bootstrapped it enough if you haven't made it uh-huh. in whatever sense that making it is for white America, right? Right. And it's to think that there's been a change in our DNA and architecture in 51 years that creates the illusion that some people believe is equality today. Mm-hmm. Is the it's the most disgusting thing I I can think of in terms of not having your mind at least open enough to the possibility that your black neighbor does not have has a much there's two Americas mm-hmm. there's two communities well, at there's two, two right? at least yeah <laughs> if you're undocumented it's a whole other thing oh, if sure. you're trans it's a, you know like That'll, yeah um, yeah there's five Americas <laughs> twenty Americas. But, uh, but anyway, that, that, that compression of time, I started thinking about my yeah. lifetime. It's barely one generation, yeah. you know, two generations of life. And to think that we've resolved it with a couple sweeps of a pen and changed people's hearts and minds of how we see people who are other than ourselves is, um, is not possible. Right. We but have I, a lot I, more work to do. I, I think it's also about um, how white people like you and me are taught to think about race and, and, and about reckon, ra- racial reconciliation, that, that we were taught it's about um, you know, being a nice person. That um, if, if you and I are nice, if we're nice and we smile to people of color, if we, if, if we have good intentions in our heart, then racism can't exist, right? And it actually goes back to MLK, because the one thing we did learn in school was MLK's I Have a Dream speech. We listened to it every, every February. And we yeah. didn't learn about Tulsa. You know, we didn't learn about other things. But we heard I Had a Dream. And what's in the I Had a Dream speech? That little black girls and, and li- little white girls will be able to play together. Mm. And so our entire concept of, like, fixing racism is based around, like, well, if we can just get along personally as individuals, sure. then the whole thing will sort itself out. Yeah. And what, I think what we're learning, hopefully we're learning, is that that... Uh, that alone is certainly has not been effective, and it has not solved the issues. Well, and just picking up the same hammer to hit yourself with uh, through you know lip service of policy change, or maybe earnest uh, efforts at policy changes that you think might be effective, but it yeah. really takes. You can't legislate yourself out of 
not being able to see and empathize with people and recognize problems. There's no, there's no policy that's going to necessarily force feed that into your brain. So you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. I have a friend, I, I was telling Jonathan Jelks, he was on the podcast yeah. just a few days ago, and I have a, a, a friend in uh, Detroit, I have lots of friends in Detroit, oh, I used to have a studio over there, and, it, and they did a whole portrait project over in Detroit, yeah, and the um, and Monica Blair is a successful R&B singer, she's in Tyler Perry Productions and Off-Broadway and traveled and stage a performer. Uh, recording artist as well and she said on Twitter it's like people people will never hear you until they see you Mm -hmm. and that just uh, stuck with me it's like of course uh, I can see you but if I'm not hearing (laughs) I have to hear what your problem to really recognize anything and it was such a simple way of sort of framing my mind around it again that um, it's simple and and so complicated and impossible at the same time to have right. us this sort of awakening. But I think we're on this, hopefully, the systemic journey of unraveling a lot of the stuff and rebuilding it. Because, again, I don't think a few strokes of the pen is going to get it done. Yeah, our children will still be working on this. But hopefully there, there'll be some progress. <laughs> For sure. We can leave it a little better than what we What haven't we covered? It. I feel like we, I, I, love that the, I love that our conversation has seemed a little more serious uh, <laughs> in terms of that. But I, um, before I let you go, is there, um, is there anything you thought about Grand Rapids or things that you want to talk about in your, in your approach as a journalist to things in the city or what you're looking forward to coming up and covering um, in the short term of, of what's happening in Grand Rapids? Do you have your particular ear to the ground of some specific things that you're like, I'm definitely going to make sure I'm listening in that part part of the community Uh, or just any story. I don't mean like, yeah, I don't know. I, my head's sort of in this right now. I mean, before this, we were trying to report on COVID before that. I'm, I, I tend to like, uh, tend to like to focus on stories that have sort of an economic component and, um, have, and, uh, so there's stories about, you know, I just did a story about uh, workers at grocery stores and how upset they were that people weren't taking the simple uh, act of wearing a mask, you know, and right. and and being kind in that way. Well, that cracks uh, so open a whole other uh, <laughs> box, can of worms with entitlement and yeah. all kinds yeah. of things yeah. and belief. Yeah, so I'm always interested in, I guess I'm always interested in stories about... Um, how economic conditions sort of affect people's everyday lives. Uh, and, and that's not totally separate from what we're talking about when we're talking about police, right? Like there's... Oh, the there's, is wrapped up in that. Yeah. Everything yeah. is. Um, but I think for now, you know, we just have to... My, my focus certainly on, on local issues is around this issue of how does the community respond to these police issues that are now prevalent yeah. everywhere. In regard to COVID, I have just one last quick question is that from what you've been seeing and reading, like, um, uh, what are your thoughts about going into the fall? We seem to be opening back up and then the looming sort of potential of the second wave and it could be worse than the first and all these other things. Man, I don't know. As a reporter, I don't know. I don't have the answer. As a person who's just living through it, I mean, I'm, I'm... I don't think it's done. I mean, it's it's not done. It's definitely not done. So yeah. I think we'll see more of that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, man. It was nice to sit down like this. Uh, I've enjoyed in, uh, your reporting. I respect Thanks. you as a journalist, and uh, I'm glad we could sit down and uh, get this done. I hope, uh, I hope that we were honest enough with each other with the, in terms of the perspective of our race that we haven't <laughs> done a disservice to people of, uh, of different yeah we'll find out two white guys talk about two, race yeah. tune in <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so uh, you know but uh, I've learned a lot so thank you very much hey thanks for having me it's great seeing you yeah. well that was an interesting conversation with Dustin I really appreciate his insights his expertise and, and when you talk about someone who really reports on issues that require a lot of background and investigation and really digging into all things to to shape the types of stories that he shapes for Michigan Radio. 
It truly was a, a great conversation, very enlightening. I hope you got something out of that as well. This is an episode, too, where there are portraits and video excerpts of our conversation on the FullExposurePodcast.com website at our uh, Full Exposure Podcast page on Facebook. And uh, even on Instagram, you'll see some excerpts from this conversation in video format. So as always, if you can give us a like on your uh, favorite podcasting platform and subscribe to us, that's always helpful. And if you see one of our posts on Facebook with video excerpt or maybe one of the portraits I shot of Dustin in the studio before we had our conversation, please uh, share it. It all helps get the word out about the podcast and... um, and uh, it's just very much appreciated. Uh, this coming fall and, and next year is going to be very exciting. And um, I'm going to be doubling and tripling down on our um, podcasting efforts here this year. So uh, I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you go get it. You have a good week. Survive the COVID. Survive everything. Survive life. And have a good one. So take care, everybody. This Full Exposure Podcast episode has been made possible through the support of Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn, who believe that creativity and the arts are essential to a rich, healthy, and fulfilling life.